Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of History Quest. This month we are out here at Schaefer's Prairie, just south of Broughton, Minnesota, one of the last remaining pieces of native tall grass prairie left in the state of Minnesota. Tall grass prairie like this we have right here was a challenging obstacle for a lot of the settlers when they were coming into Minnesota. It was it was marked with small little sloughs and ponds. There were groves of trees like this and there was a lot of swampy area mixed in with the prairie. Not to mention that in some places the prairie could grow as high as a man on horse or the grass if you will would grow as high as a man on horse. At any rate when the settlers came here this is what they had to deal with when it came to clearing the land and building their homes. Many of the settlers who had came to Minnesota to build their homes weren't accustomed to living on the tall grass prairie as were the Native Americans who were here centuries before them. The Dakota Sioux claimed most of central and south central Minnesota as their homeland until 1862 when tragedy struck the state and marked the bloodiest chapter in Minnesota history. The U.S.-Dakota War of 1862 is certainly the darkest chapter of Minnesota history. The fur trade is heavy in Minnesota. The fur trade is big in Minnesota. There is, um, you know, there, there, there's woods, there's prairie, there is an abundance of game in Minnesota. And so you have the Dakota who see this and see that this game is, you know, plentiful and worth a lot of money, that the fur that is on them is worth a lot of money. So you have guys like Martin McLeod, Henry Sibley, going out into the countryside, um, you know, mostly Martin McLeod, and he'll go to the different, the various tribes that are, you know, out along the Minnesota and the Mississippi River valleys, and even Missouri River out in the Dakotas, and he'll say, okay, um, we are expecting mink is going to be popular, or mink is going to be bringing in a lot of money, or beaver or uh, deer, buckskin, something like that. So concentrate your efforts on that. So your, your actual trappers, or you know, not trappers, your hunters who are gathering the fur are the Dakota and the Ojibwa in the north. Um, they are giving fur, which is a valuable good, and they're bringing it to the trade merchant, and they're giving them this fur for guns, ammunition, blankets, trading valuable goods for valuable goods. Well, what happens is the bottom of the fur trade falls out. Um, the old popular beaver hat, you know, and the, and the fur, big fur jackets are out of style. People want more exotic types of materials now like uh, silk. So what happens is these trade merchants along with the Dakota go to the federal government and they say, hey, you've got to do something for this. You know, these people, they're, they're in danger here you know they have no way to make money and not only that we have no way to make money because they're the ones buying all of our stuff so we're gonna go bankrupt if they're not buying our stuff so what they decide is well let's sell some of our land right and this is where you come into the treaty of 1851 they uh, sell off most of their land the Dakota do to the whites and uh, in return they receive annuity payments they receive goods they receive gifts Plus, you know, they're going to, the, well, the annuity payment, they're going to be receiving money into the future. And this money is supposed to keep their heads above water. Here's where they start getting cheated because, number one, the traders come in and they say, hey, 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 we want you to sign this extra copy of the treaty. And the chiefs are like, oh, yeah, sure, fine. You know, they make their marks or sign their names because these weren't all illiterate people. You know, there were some smart people here. They were leaders of their people for a reason, not because they were stupid. It was because they were smart people. So they say, yeah, sure. And what happens is these aren't copies of the treaty. They are contracts saying that the money first goes to the traders and they will deduct what is owed and then give the Dakota the rest. Well, kind of backhanded, right? So what happens is these traders now realizing that they have the upper hand in that. They can charge whatever the heck they want for these goods and the Dakota are forced to pay them because they sign the, the leaders, sign the contracts to say, yeah, we'll pay that. And so what happens is they start falling deeper into debt. Well, by 1858, we're in the exact same boat again. Um, the traders are, they've inflated their prices greatly and you have all of these, you know, Dakota bands that are starving 
they are deep in debt to the traders and so they are forced to sell even more of their land and now they're on this tiny little strip of land along the Minnesota River. Typically they would get their annuities in June of every year. Well June passes and there's no money coming. Um, they go to their, the, the leaders of the Dakota, they go to the agent. Um, every, you know, the reservation would have an agent who is basically the go-between um, between the Dakota leaders and the government. And so they go to the agent and they say, hey, what's going on? Where's our money? Our people are getting hungry. And the agent says, don't worry, it's coming. We're just, you know, we're, there's a war going on. Things are slow to come, but it'll be here. Don't worry, you were promised it'll come, it'll come. So they go back to their villages, you know, satisfied with that, saying, okay, 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 the money's going to come. Well, another month passes, we're into July, and things are getting bad again. So the, so the people, the Dakota, are, they're hungry again. Um, you know, some of, them are, some of them are on the verge of starvation. And so the chiefs, again, go to the agent, and they say, hey, what's going on? And again, the agent sends them back and says, don't worry, don't worry, the money's coming. So what happens is, um, a number of the Dakota gather at the agency stores and they are basically ready to storm in and just take the food. Um, Little Crow himself says, you know, sometimes hungry men help themselves. They, they make a case, they say your warehouses are full of food and you know our money's supposed to be coming but you've cut off credit, you won't let us do this. People have already died of starvation, some bands have resorted to eating horses and uh, so they gather at the agency and, and make their case, well, the agent was afraid this was going to happen. So he actually has soldiers from Fort Ridgely, which is nearby, come to guard the warehouses. Now, in a kind of interesting little ironic twist, you know, the agent thinks that the soldiers are going to protect him and the goods. And actually the uh, commanding officer turns on the agent and makes him open the doors, give these guys some food. This is ridiculous. You got the food give them some darn food. So they do, because of course, if you have the army saying, give them some food, you're gonna give them some food. So anyway, they take their food, they head back to the village, and actually people, because you know, there's whispers of war going on this whole time, and people are actually kind of relieved. They think, okay, war has been averted. We have our food, we can eat, you know, or, or, we're saved. We can just make it now for a couple more months until that annuity payment arrives and we're good to go. Well, a couple weeks later, on August 17th, you have four young men from the Rice Creek Band and they are in Acton, Minnesota. And reports kind of vary a little bit on what happens, um, but the facts of it are they're going along a fence line that belongs, of course, to a settler and they find some hen's eggs, you know, chicken, hen's eggs, sitting, you know, next to the fence. And they're out on a hunting trip. They were unsuccessful. They're hungry. And so one of them bends down to grab the eggs, and another one says, don't do that. They belong to that settler, and we're going to get in trouble if you do that, so don't do that. Well, the one who reached the eggs, or reached for the eggs, he turns around and he says, hey, you know what? You're, you're coward. You're, you're half-starved. And you're so afraid of that white guy over there, you won't even take an egg to feed yourself. They go to the farmhouse and uh, they engage in a shooting match with the farmer, not at each other like, uh, you know, target practice. The farmer shoots his gun, he doesn't reload. The four Dakota do reload, and then they turn on the farmer and the people that are out there on the farm with them and, you know, essentially murder them. Uh, they turn around, they run back to their village, and they tell what happened, and they tell their chiefs. And, and also, you know, it's good to point out here that the village that these are from um, during the Sioux Uprising or Dakota War is one of the more uh, violent. Um, some of the, the more gruesome killings actually came from this band, and they were, so I don't know if you'd want to say warlike or, or what, but uh, the leaders of this band were for going to war with whites. And so anyway, they, they're enthralled at how easy they were able to kill, you know, this family. And so they say, you know, we can go to war, but we're just going to get demolished if it's just our little band. So they go to Little Crow. He gets woken up out of bed, and uh, these leaders from the Rice Creek Band, plus the four 
who murdered and a number of other leaders, you know, like a little delegation or a council, if you will, they come into Little Crow's room and they tell him what happens. And he's actually devastated. He puts black soot on his face to show that he's in mourning. He still tries to say, don't do it. This is stupid. Don't do it. Well, they argue. And um, according to the story as told by Little Crow's son, they call him a coward. And then he kind of turns and he says, oh, yeah, I'll show you what kind of coward I am. I'll go to war, too. Well, so that morning, they go to war. They go to the reservation, the lower agency at the reservation. They um, start killing, you know, the store owners. Um, those first few days, there was very little mercy showed. I mean, women, children are killed. They, they torture. It's, it's brutal. Eventually, they, they go and they attack Fort Ridgely, and they're, you know, they, they don't succeed in that. They attack New Alm, which again, they uh, don't really succeed at attacking New Alm. They kind of do, but they kind of don't. Um, at any rate, after about a month, you know, the, the fighting's almost over. After about a month, uh, refugees, you know, these settlers out on the prairie turn to refugees. Um, a lot of the little towns, you know, Hutchinson, Winstead, um, Glencoe, they all built little forts. And uh, there's almost every little settlement that was around at that time built a little fort and all the people on the countryside went and stayed in that fort until they could evacuate to the east some of them went to fort you know st paul um, some of them just went kind of north and east to st cloud um, some of them <laughs> went all the way back east and said i'm never going out west again actually a lot of them did that and uh anyway um little crow and his followers are you know they're dwindling um by autumn there's very few left a lot of them have fled out west into the dakotas and into canada um, the the ones that are remaining are the ones who most of them had absolutely nothing to do with what happens little crow turns all of the prisoners of war which are mostly women and children turns them all over to the uh the dakota who are have chosen to stay here who like i said are mostly innocent um the U.S. Army, under command of Henry Sibley, go in and they, you know, they get all of the the refugees back, the prisoners, and then all of the men who are remaining, they put on trial, and he picks 300 of them who either admitted to or somebody else said that they were at these battles, and sentence them to death. Um, later, Abraham Lincoln takes that list of 300 and looks at it and says, "History is going to judge what we do right here." And so he whittles it down to 39 of the people who are um, said to have committed the most heinous, you know, crimes, crimes against humanity kind of stuff. And uh, sentence, sentences them to hang um, right before the executions, which take place in Mankato, Minnesota. One of them is um, pardoned and 38 of them are hung. Now, the remaining that are at the reservation, they are brought to a camp in St. Paul or at Fort Snelling. Um, conditions were not good at this camp. Um, some people call it a prison and you can make that case but remember that they also had passes. They could come and go from the camp as they wanted. Um, the camp was actually meant for their own protection. Like I said conditions were horrendous at this camp but it was meant for their own protection because the settlers in Minnesota are enraged at what's happening. I mean this is you know, we could, this is akin to how Americans felt during 9-11. I mean, we look at it differently today, you know, than people did in 1862, but that's the kind of anger that was there with the settlers in Minnesota. And uh, the, the government knows this, the army knows this, so they say we can't just leave these people on the reservation or the lynch mobs are going to take over, and we don't want that. So they, in a sense, evacuate them or march them, if you will, to this camp or camps in Fort Snelling, and that's where they stay. They're behind a stockade wall. Um, act actually, on the way there, you know, they have a sold, they have a guard with them on the way there, and uh, a lot of people think that that guard was there to keep, you know, to watch the Dakotas. Well, no, they weren't. That guard was there to watch the settlers to make sure that nobody came and tried to kill these Dakotas because the guards know and the government knows that these are the people that. Did nothing and in fact some of them were allowed to stay in Minnesota um, at any rate uh, they are eventually 
booted out of the state and they are split up and they either go to the Rice Creek Reservation in, uh, I, th I think it's Rice Creek, anyway, they go to a reservation in South Dakota or the Santee Reservation in Nebraska and are not allowed back in Minnesota. And so when you look at the whole thing, you know, it's today, today in, in our modern age, we kind of look for the victim and we look for who to blame. And the sad thing is the people you know, to blame, well, many of them were killed, you know, some of these traitors that caused this. Um, but on the other side, you know, the people that committed some of these, you know, war crimes, crimes against humanity, fled, which, you know, of course they're going to flee and uh, basically get off. You know, they aren't punished for what they did. And the people that were innocent, you know, the, the families living out on the frontiers, not to mention the nearly 2,000, and don't quote me on that number, but the nearly 2,000 Dakota still living on the reservation that are forced to leave their homeland, that's the real tragedy of the entire, the entire thing. So, All right, so we're going to take a break right here because I'd like to share a story with you about a local family that was killed south of Broughton in the war, as well as a neat little legend associated with that family. It was August of 1862. Samuel and Laura White and their children, Susan and Otis, were living on Lake Addy in Sumter Township, McLeod County. The Dakota Indians who lived on a reservation some miles south of them were frustrated with their situation for a number of reasons. On August 18, 1862, they went to war with the Whites, killing hundreds. On September 22, 1862, a small Dakota raiding party attacked the Whites at their home, killing all four of them. Soldiers retrieved three bodies for burial on September 25, but they could not find Susan. Her body was found later, some distance from the family home, alone out on the prairie. The family shares one gravestone, with Samuel and Laura noted on the side, and Susan and Otis on the opposite side. The inscriptions read, Samuel and Laura White, killed by Indians at Lake Addy, September 22, 1862, aged 52 and 45 years, and Susan M. and Otis White, killed by the Indians at Lake Addy on September 22, 1862, aged 14 and 12 years. The monument to the slain White family serves as a permanent reminder of the innocent men, women, and children on isolated farms and townships who were victims of the uprising. You've heard the story of the White family and their tragic deaths during that fateful September day in 1862. How a mother, a father, and four children were slain during a time of war, and how one girl was left out on the prairie to die and not found till weeks later. But legend has it that there was actually a third child by the name of Samuel Jr. that somehow disappeared during the event and was never heard from again. on everybody's mind in Broughton, though, was what happened to the fourth child, Samuel Jr. A strange story was told many years ago by the late John Beach. He believed that the boy had somehow escaped the Indians and lived to a good old age not far from home at that. As late as the First World War, there were still heavy stands of timber in the eastern part of McLeod County, and they extended intermittently out into the prairie. Two young lads of the beach relationship were ardent hunters, and one day in the woods they came upon a hut where an old man lived. Certain things soon led Jack and Elijah to believe that the elderly recluse might indeed be the long missing white boy. Oh, he had a number of guns in his cabin, the most cherished being an old Enfield rifle which he kept polished and displayed with pride. The boys noted a number of notches neatly cut into the stock. What are those for, Elijah asked curiously. Have you really shot six bears? Nah, the old man exclaimed. Not bars. Them other varmints. He spat out the words when he called them varmints. The boys thought best not to question him any farther. They returned again and again to visit the old man, who always welcomed them rather solemnly and closed mouthed. As fall approached, they decided to make one final visit before winter set in. They came to the cabin, 
found the old hermit gone. His rifle was not in his custom place, so they assumed he went out hunting. Since the old man was gone, the boys made themselves at home in the cabin and waited for the old man to return. But as the day waned and the sun began sinking below the horizon, they decided it was time to leave and head for home. At the same time, the state fair was going on, and an odd incident occurred the next evening. On an open-air stage, in front of the grandstand, a group of Dakota Indians in full regalia were in front of the grandstand and were the feature attraction as they were singing and chanting during their dances. While giving their demonstration, two bullets whizzed through the air toward the group out on the platform. Few in the audience realized what had happened. The performers seemed unperturbed, and the only casualty was a couple of feathers cut off the showy headdress one of the performers was wearing. But through a cub reporter who was present, the incident was relayed to the Twin Cities newspaper and played up with many humorous touches. The good fall weather meant the two beach boys could go out hunting one more time. They decided to head for a farewell visit to the old hermit. This time he was at home, and this time he was in a happy mood. At first they thought the old friend had been drinking, but he soon lapsed into his usual solemn ways. The days were growing shorter, and the lads left for home earlier than usual. They had gone some distance when Jack stopped and looked behind him. The old man had an axe, and he was chopping kindling for his breakfast. He was much too far away to hear them, so they decided to lower their voices and speak about what they had just witnessed. Jack lowered his voice and looked at Elijah and said, Did you notice anything different back there? Something kind of weird about the old man? Yes, Elijah replied. He seemed to be in higher spirits than normal. No, 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 not that. Something else, said Jack. What do you mean, said Elijah? There were two more notches in the old man's gun. All right, thanks everybody for watching this month's episode of History Quest. We'll pick up the story again next month, um, but first I'd like to just share with you a few events that are gonna be happening at the museum this September. We have two authors coming, Craig Bishop with his book, Billy Sunday, The uh, Baseball Evangelist, as well as uh, Phyllis Cole Dye, who will be at the museum speaking about her book, Beneath the Same Stars, which incidentally is also about the Dakota War of 1862. In addition to that, our Tuesday Morning Breakfast Club is going to feature Gary Lenz, and he's going to be sharing a little bit about uh, McLeod County Railroad history. So don't miss out on these great events that are coming up this month, and we will see you again next month. Thanks for watching.